So just to begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather, or on which I am today, rather, since we're all on Zoom, is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people, land that was dispossessed, disenfranchised, and expropriated from them as part of an ongoing project of settler colonialism and genocide. We pay respect to the Anishinaabe Omanmawi people who are the original guardians of this land. We thank them for their stewardship of the land. We acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. We welcome the resistance and resurgence of indigenous peoples as part of the decolonizing process. And in particularly here at ICLMG, we recognize the incredible detrimental effects and the impacts of Canada's national security laws and anti-terrorism laws and the war on terror on, on fighting against indigenous land defenders and um, from across, across these lands. Um, again, I'd like to thank everybody for being here for our panel on 20 years of the Anti-Terrorism Act. Um, in a second, uh, I'll get to introducing our three really wonderful panelists who have agreed to join us today. Um, but just some uh, intro introductions to the event and some uh, housekeeping. Um, we're asking everyone to please stay muted throughout the uh, entire event. Um, we will have a question and answer period later on, and it'd be wonderful if people could post their questions in the chat. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, my colleague uh, Anne Dagenet is here, and they will be happy to help. Uh, you can chat with them directly um, if you have any technical difficulties, but please don't uh, unmute yourself to uh, ask any technical problems. Um, we're going to start with uh, some brief introductory comments from our three speakers, and then we'll uh, have a conversation. Um, we'll uh, ask a few questions. Uh, they'll interact with each other. Um, and then uh, after about 40 to 45 minutes of that, we'll go to the question and answer period. Um, it should last about an hour to, an, well, about an hour and a half. We'll uh, be done around 1.30. Um, also, we're recording today's session, um, just so everyone knows. Um, and uh, we'll be sharing it after the event as well. So you'll be able to, if you can't stay the, the entire time, you'll be able to tune in later on. Um, or you'll be able to share it with your, your colleagues and friends and networks. Um, and with anyone who you think would be uh, interested in, in learning about um, the issues that we're talking about today. So as uh, many of you will know from just simply joining today's call, uh, December 18th will mark the 20th anniversary of the Anti-Terrorism Act, known then as Bill C-36, adopted in December 2001. It was Canada's first anti-terrorism laws, uh, first official anti-terrorism laws and act that had a, a huge and a long lasting impact on Canada's legal landscape. Um, it came, uh, it was one of the fastest uh, implemented pieces of legislation, especially given the size of this legislation, uh, being introduced in October, 2001 and being adopted in December, 2001. So if we think of how long other pieces of legislation take to go through the parliamentary process that get interrupted by prorogation and elections, um, you know, I think we can think of the conversion therapy bill that was just uh, passed so, so quickly, finally, uh, but that faced delay upon delay um, through parliamentary procedures, um, that the fact that a, a bill of this magnitude and scope uh, was able to pass in, in simply a few months demonstrated what many at the time argued was the urgency, but also the lack of debate, the lack of input, and the lack of critical discussion around uh, these laws. Um, and the, you know, it, it really speaks to that, that 20 years later, we're continuing to have to examine, investigate, and discuss the impacts of these laws um, and, the, and what they've had on Canadian society and, and society internationally. These laws haven't only had an impact within uh, the, the borders of our country, but also around the world. Um, and that's why we've, we've entitled this session today, not just the Anti-Terrorism Act, but Canada's legacy and its war on terror. Um, I wanted to just read a, a few excerpts and share a bit of analysis from that time from some of the members that eventually joined uh, the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group. Um, actually, and for many of you who may not know our organization, we're a coalition of 45 groups across Canada, and we were formed in the uh, aftermath of the adoption of uh, Bill C-36, the Anti-Terrorism Act, um, and Canada's joining of the War on Terror, explicitly because organizations recognized that there needed to be critical debate, pushback, 
um, an advocacy and research around the impacts of this new bill um, and of this new framework, because really it goes beyond one bill, but this new policing and national security framework um, that was adopted so hastily after 9-11. Um, um, so some of the groups who would eventually join our coalition at the time did speak out. Um, I wanted to share what the Canadian Association of University Teachers actually said at the time. Um, they wrote that the government has told us that this extraordinary piece of legislation, the Anti-Terrorism Act, is necessary to meet a new and extraordinary threat we are facing as a society, technologically sophisticated terrorism. And whether we believe the threat is new and extraordinary or simply a serious ongoing problem, we may be willing to accept extraordinary measures to deal with it if we believe that, to quote, they will not become normalized, but rather will somehow stand outside and not affect, unquote, the ordinary set of legal rules and norms in our society. But the idea that we can isolate draconian laws from the normal background of our society is a false belief. Draconian laws enacted in a time of crisis have a way of taking on a life of their own. If enacted as temporary laws or reviewable laws, like the Anti-Terrorism Act, they have a way of becoming permanent. Their provisions intensify. They function creep. They become the new normal as authorities and the public grow accustomed to their use, paving the way for even more draconian laws to be added in increasing doses over time. Um, and this is, you know, I, I think for many of us, those words are very prescient of what we've seen over the last 20 years. Um, at the time as well, the Canadian Council on American Islamic Relations, uh, which no longer exists, but uh, a lot of their work has been taken up by the National Council of Canadian Muslims, as well as the Canadian Arab Federation uh, wrote together that the Anti-Terrorism Act and security certificates offend the most basic principles of the rule of law and make a mockery of the basic constitutional guarantee of a fair trial. Both laws have invigorated and legitimized the targeting of Canadian Muslims and Arabs. Those provisions that offend the rule of law must be changed and our government must institute measures to, to ensure effective oversight and accountability of our security agencies. And I think as you will we'll hear in today's discussion, uh, those laws have not been changed, they have not been rescinded, many have been strengthened, and while we do have a, a degree of greater uh, oversight and accountability, much remains to be done. Um, so on that note, I'd like to uh, move to introducing our, our, two spe our th three speakers sorry, um, today and uh, get into their, their opening remarks on, um, on why we're here today and their concerns about 20 years of uh, Canada's national security um, uh, legislation and its involvement in the war on terror. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce Aziza Kanji. Uh, Aziza is a legal academic, writer, and director of programming at Noor Cultural Centre in Toronto. Her work focuses on racism, law, and social justice. Her writing has appeared in the Toronto Star, National Post, Ottawa Citizen, Open Democracy, Roar Magazine, iPolitics, Policy Options, and various academic anthologies and journals. Aziza received her JD from uh, the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law and LLM, specializing in Islamic Law from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Thanks for being here with us today, Aziza. Uh, after Aziza, we'll hear from Alex Neve. Um, Alex is presently, presently an adjunct professor in international human rights law at the University of Ottawa and Dalhousie University and a senior fellow with the University of Ottawa's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. He served as Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada's English branch from 2000 to 2020. In that role, he led and took part in over 40 human rights research and advocacy delegations throughout Africa, Asia, Latin America, Guantanamo Bay, and closer to home First Nations communities in Canada. Alex is a lawyer with an LLB from Dalhousie University and a master's degree in international human rights law from the University of Ethics. Essex. Finally, Dr. Pamela Palmater is a Mi'kmaq lawyer and member of the Eel River Bar First Nation in, nor uh, sorry, in Northern New Brunswick. She is currently a professor and the chair of Indigenous Governments at Ryerson University. Dr. Palmater has been studying, volunteering, and working in First Nation issues for over 30 years on a wide range of social, political, and legal issues. Dr. Palmater holds a BA from St. Thomas in Native Studies an LLB from University of New Brunswick, and her master's and doctorate in law from Dalhousie University Law School, specializing in indigenous and human rights law. Thank you so much to the three of you for being here with us today. It's really an honor to bring together three 
people who have done so much work on these issues and have spoken out and, and put so much of, of your, your efforts and energy into fighting against, um, fighting for human rights, fighting for, uh, against laws that discriminate. Um, and uh, it's really an honor to, to be able to discuss this with you today. Um, and with that, without ado, I'll pass it along to Aziza to start things off. Thank you, Tim and Anne, and ICLMG for curating this conversation. It is such an honor for me to be here today, even if it's on this um, unhappy birthday event for the Anti-Terrorism Act uh, with Pam and Alex, whose work have been such beacons over the years in challenging many of the obfuscations that are taken for granted uh, through hegemonic discourse. So thank you, Tim and Pam, Alex. Thank you to all of you who are here uh, today um, uh, with us. I'm speaking to you from Toronto, uh, the territory of the, of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas. Often, as settlers, we articulate these land acknowledgements and then simply move on from them, as if the conversations that we are having can be dissociated from the fact that they are occurring on colonized land, the product of settler genocides. But how can we talk about anti-terrorism premised on the juxtaposition between quote unquote terrorist violence presumed inherently illegitimate versus state violence presumed inherently legitimate? How can we talk about so-called anti-terrorism and terrorism without first interrogating the settler colonial foundations of that state sovereignty, which claims the right to a monopoly on the legitimate exercise of violence in the first place. How can we talk about so-called national security without first interrogating the foundations behind which the concepts of the nation and security have been organized, the centuries of intertwined anti-Indigenous, anti-Black, and anti-Muslim violence and racism lying at the heart of the European colonial project. Violence that continues to reproduce itself through the mass incarceration of indigenous and black communities, the terrorization of Muslim communities, the brutalization of indigenous land and water defenders as the world has witnessed, for instance, with the um, militarized raids on Wet'suwet'en land and water defenders in recent weeks. But the history of violence is simultaneously also a history of resistance, which I was reminded when reading the archives of opposition by organizations like ICLMG, Amnesty International, indigenous organizations, Muslim organizations, the long archives of opposition to the depredations of the Anti-Terrorism Act, which have been challenged for the last 20 years. It's instantiation of a definition of terrorism, which made religious, political, and ideological motive a central component of terrorism, a license for religious and racial profiling. The Anti-Terrorism Act, which criminalized a broad swath of actions far disconnected from any act of violence at all, even as the actions, the abusive actions of security agencies continue to be hidden and protected behind walls of security and impunity. The targeting of communities through quasi-criminal measures that exert much of the brute force of criminalization without e even any of the minimal checks. Measures like terrorist entities listings, preventive arrests, um, no-fly lists, measures that have been instituted and instantiated and entrenched over the last 20 years through liberal and conservative governments alike. 20 years may seem like a long time, an eternity almost, to those of us who cannot imagine, cannot remember a time or a life before the onset of the war on terror and the national security state. Yet 20 years of the Anti-Terrorism Act, even 150 years of the Canadian settler state are mere blinks in the eye of history in the context of the long thousands of years of history of people who have lived, made law, uh, loved, governed on this land that currently calls itself Canada. 
And so occasions such as this one, when we are gathered to reflect on the legacy of the Anti-Terrorism Act after 20 years, are vital opportunities, vital occasions for us to remember histories and presence that have existed far exceeding the boundaries of imagination of the war on terror, national security, settler colonial state, so that we may perhaps, inshallah, build a, build a future that exists beyond these limitations. So thank you, Tim, and thank you, Pam, Alex. I look forward to hearing uh, from you and continuing this conversation with all of you who are here today. I guess I'll turn it over to Pam. Thank you so much, Aziza. Actually, it'll be Alex going, uh, going next, but thanks so much. And uh, yeah, moving along to you, Alex. <clears throat> uh, thanks very much, uh, Tim and, uh, and ICLMG. And, and what an absolute honor it is to be joining two inspiring thinkers and activists like Aziza and Pam for this session. Uh, and um, I, like Tim in his opening, am joining you from unceded Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory today. And uh, and and very delighted to be part of this important, if sobering, uh, conversation because it certainly is sobering to to have that uh, anniversary of twenty years uh, put in front of us. And and it does take me back uh, to the time I I certainly was in my role at Amnesty International at the time and the campaigning as Bill C-36 made its way, as Tim reminded us, at lightning speed uh, through Parliament was, was to say the least intense. It was a very difficult time for human rights advocacy in those months after 9-11 uh, to, to even just raise human rights questions, let alone concerns or recommendations, was to immediately pilloried as somehow being unpatriotic, an apologist for terror, or even treasonous or traitorous. Um, and that was tough um, and uh, uh, tough for many reasons, but obviously first and foremost, because there were so many important human rights concerns uh, that needed attention. And um, what I thought I'd do is, is I, I went back to that time and, and, and came up with a very quick list of just eight, the list could be much longer, but, but eight of the kinds of human rights concerns that were on the minds of so many of us and were, we're at the center of the advocacy we were doing. And I'll, I'll just kind of list and say a brief word about each of them. Um, and we can come back to some of this, I'm sure, in the Q&A. Um, and I hope that in doing so, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of find yourself nodding, recognizing that these concerns that were on people's minds in 2001 are absolutely, uh, number one, uh, sadly, have often very much proven to be true. Uh, and secondly, uh, are very much still with us as current concerns now. Uh, so first was root causes. Uh, and, and this was the fact that it, that it was so obvious that we needed to, to not just consider and be able to talk about, but to address the longstanding and deep human rights failings that lay behind situations of insecurity and violence. Um, but that was shut down. Even to try to open up that conversation uh, met a harsh rebuke um, and threats and worse that somehow in doing that, you were suggesting that terrorism was justified. So we weren't allowed to have that conversation at all. Secondly is the false debate about security uh, and human rights. Uh, there clearly was, you didn't need to be a legal scholar to know that, that there was concern that these new anti-terrorism laws and policies, the ones we got in 2001 and the others that have followed um, in, in years since, violated international human rights, violated the Charter, violated the Canadian Human Rights Act, violated all sorts of human rights safeguards. Um, and obviously in doing so uh, were unjust, uh, but that it wasn't just that, uh, they were also likely only to deepen insecurity. Uh, and, uh, and thus how crucial it would be to get ourselves out of that false dichotomy, that, that false debate about security or human rights, security versus human rights. You know, you can just remember how those prepositions are the ones that are so often used and really shift it instead to a debate, not a debate, but a, a commitment to security through uh, human rights. Number three was the concern about embarking on this initiative of defining terrorism. Um, and there was so much that was problematic here. 
uh, uh, and many of us spoke out saying that it just it, it wasn't possible, it certainly wasn't necessary, uh, but that it also wasn't wise uh, to be setting a definition of terrorism, uh, because in doing so, it was inevitably going to cause human rights grief um, uh, in many ways, but but two most obviously. Uh, number one, the fact that this notion of proving political, religious, or ideological motivation as an integral requirement in the offense uh, was going to be very problematic. And secondly, uh, the wide sweep of the definition uh, and the risk of it including disruptive actions, land occupations, blockades, civil disobedience, etc., cetera, uh, as possible acts of terrorism. Number four, whose terrorism. Uh, and I think Tim's already referred to this a bit in his opening comments, but this inescapable debate about whose terrorism is criminalized and whose is not. Uh, noting, and, uh, and we used many examples at the time, that, uh, that certainly the activities of some groups uh, don't attract the label, uh, but that similarly the military campaigns and security and policing operations of many governments uh, which clearly satisfy all of the same components of the definition, but are not taken up and condemned uh, as terrorism. Uh, I'm losing track here. I think number five, the new normal. Um, there was so much worry uh, that despite all of the, ta the talk about this being extraordinary and time limited, that what we were truly witnessing was a shift to a new normal and that these restrictive measures would almost certainly not be rolled back and would creep in many directions, both intended or unintended. Lo and behold, here we are 20 years on. Uh, number six, discrimination, racism, and hate. Uh, inevitable concern that in the post 9-11 context, all of this would certainly have a disproportionate impact on Muslim, Arab, South Asian communities. Uh, and, and let's not fool ourselves that disproportionate impact is some sort of banal term. What that means is discrimination, it means racism, it means hate, it means violence. Uh, and here we are uh, 20 years on and of course, you know, that we could have an entire session on how that has proven to be the case over those 20 years. Number seven, extra legal counterterrorism. Um, we flagged very much at the time, and boy, did this prove to be the case, that uh, even with all this law reform, the likelihood that so much anti-terrorism activity was going to take place outside of legal frameworks. Extraordinary rendition, uh, you know, black sites, um, you know, places like Bagram and Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo Bay, etc., uh, entered the lexicon. Uh, and nowadays, today in 2021, we have Northeast Syria and, you know, nearly four dozen Canadians who have, again, been abandoned outside of legal frameworks. Uh, and then lastly, secrecy and a lack of accountability. Uh, we, of course, before September the 11th already had well entrenched cultures of secrecy, a lack of transparency, no accountability with respect to the activities of national security uh, agencies. Uh, and uh, and this was inevitably this whole anti-terrorism framework was only going to deepen that, um, and uh, and that's again not just so sort of a bleak notion of you know isn't it a shame that things are secret? Secrecy breeds human rights violations. We've always known that, and that's proven to be case over the twenty years since. Lots more to say, but we'll get into that in the Q and A. Thank you so much, Alex, and, and it's great to have that rundown and perspective from uh, from when the bill was enacted and, and the, you know, the, the debates and discussions that were happening there. And thanks very much. And uh, now we'll pass it along to uh, Pam Palmeter. Thanks, everybody. Quainin uh, Deloisi, Pam Palmeter. I'm from the sovereign Mi'kmaq Nation and unceded Mi'kmaq and my home community is Ugbeganjig. Uh, but today I'm on the sovereign territories of Mississauga's Skugog, and I just want to echo everyone's comments so far. It's an honor to be a part of this panel with human rights activists and people who really care about the well being of uh, human beings. And I think it's important to cover this issue from a wide variety of perspectives. Yes, there's the public safety, national security. There's also law enforcement, the political angle, the legal angle, human rights and indigenous sovereignty. But we also can't forget what's literally right in front of us and that there's big money in fear and control and creating monsters 
and demons to perpetuate or further economic interests. And there's also big politics in expanding what's now considered terror for the benefit of large extractive industries and other corporations and other interests. And while there's like no doubt that this may have started with a focus on so-called international terrorism and possible threats, for Indigenous peoples, this is a 500-year process. And even if you want to cut Canada a break and say, okay, no, we can only talk about post-Confederation, we've still been dealing with uh, this issue of nationalized vilification of First Nations for 154 years. We have literally been created into an Indigenous terror threat. And that theme has remained consistent pre and post confederation. And so for us, the problem we've always seen is it's the state in all of its forms have been engaged in breaching our human rights and our civil liberties for this entire time. All this legislation does, and you know, even Bill C-51's omnibus legislation that came after was trying to legalize what they had always been doing anyway that they knew was illegal, they knew violated indigenous rights, human rights, and, and a whole swath of legal issues. So basically trying to pass laws to make legal what they knew what was illegal under the guise of terror, under the guise of uh, interim, you know, limited, extraordinary, all of the things that Aziza and Alex have said. But long before this, the state has always been numbering, documenting, monitoring, surveilling in First Nations people, particularly Indians, creating terrorists where none existed to justify extraction, to justify settlement, to justify creating railways. And so First Nations, Indians have been vilified as dangerous, savage threats to national security all throughout history, even into today. But it's important to understand that this is, it's not like it's recent that we've talked about things like national security. So even before Canada was a state, you had colonial officials who had enacted scalping bounties under the guise of protecting settlement and national security, protecting settlers from Mi'kmaq people because we wouldn't give up our lands. So national security at that time was about protecting these colonial interests in lands, resources, and trade routes, also known as economic and financial stability today, you know, some of those same words can easily translate. And the Northwest Mounted Police and the RCMP, and of course the military had the primary role to clear the lands for settlement and transportation and extraction of resources. And even knowingly engaged in illegal activities at the bidding of the state. We often hear that the RCMP is independent from the state, uh, but they're clearly not because during the time when Indians were trapped on reserves and we weren't allowed to go hunting and fishing without permission, the RCMP's own lawyers raised the illegality of all of those surveilling, monitoring, and, and trapping, restricting movement of Indigenous peoples, First Nations. And when, when questioned, the Indian agent said, yes, but this is what we need to do. So the RCMP did it anyway, knowing it was illegal. They basically did the bidding of the state. And you can carry that forward to today. Now they're doing the bidding of the state, aka corporations as well, um, and monitoring, controlling, and surveilling our movements under the guise that we are now some kind of eco terrorist and we present an eco terrorist threat because we are unarmed, we're peaceful, literally living in cabins on our lands, trying to protect it from environmental destruction. It is as far removed from eco terrorism as you could possibly imagine. But it's if you have to follow it all through history and how they've consistently portrayed First Nations as some kind of domestic terrorist threat or threat to national security and public safety. It's a, one of the reasons why they have criminalized hunting, fishing, gathering, uh, tobacco, manufacturing tobacco, something Europeans didn't even know about until they landed here. Now, all of these things fall under the guise of contraband or organized 
crime and you see uh, a very high skyrocketing rate in arrests, uh, in charges, in fines, in seizures, also in incarceration rates. And of course, you know, even peaceful unarmed land defenders are now considered threats to national security. And that was our primary concern. So yes, we know it's been like 20 years, but it wasn't that long ago under the Harper era that Bill C-51, we were all standing shoulder to shoulder against Bill C-51 and the scope creep of what is considered terror and what you're allowed to do if it is considered domestic forms of terror. Now we're talking about diplomatic relations, we're talking about economic activity, we're talking about a whole bunch of things outside of what was really should have been in the scope. And it seemed to center primarily on economics at the end of the day. And so that's when you had the Minister of Indian Affairs at the time calling chiefs rogues and threats to national security in the parliament, like literally in the house, identifying us as threats to national security, or, you know, my favorite Premier, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney, calling people like me and David Suzuki, militants, zealots, uh, dangerous, and you've got all of them, RCMP, CSIS, D&D, uh, Fisheries Notions, any enforcement agency describing Indigenous peoples in modern times as violent, radical insurgents, eco-terrorists, and basically an Indigenous terror threat. And so we see this rolling out today. Where are the most resources internally, domestically being put in terms of uh, snipers, armed vehicles, helicopters, attack dogs, you know, paramilitary cops, whether it be the OPP, the RCMP or anyone else, where are those resources consistently being directed? They're being directed at Wet'suwet'en, Shekwepmik people, Mi'kmaq people, Haudenosaunee people, always on our own territories, and they use a wide variety of information sharing. My concern with Indigenous terrorism or this Indigenous terror threat that they've manufactured is that has gone well beyond state institutions into corporate institutions. It's where they work with corporations and private security to exchange information, private information, information about Indigenous peoples, and that the, the corporate, there's a corporate interest in this. And then the interplay, the economics, like I said at the very beginning, between the RCMP pension being invested in TC Energy, which is the parent company of Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, and even the public pension system so heavily heavily invested in these extractive projects, which Indigenous resistance is, is treated like domestic terrorism, when there are really serious issues that we should be dealing with. And I could go on and on and on about this, but uh, my concern, I guess, is the scope creep and how it's gone outside of state institutions. And it's really in this corporate era with the big, massive extractive industry companies now engaged in monitoring, surveillance, reporting, and the security measures on the ground. Thanks so much, Pam. That's really informative and really places the the you know places the context of these laws going back much further than you know uh, two thousand and one, but to the you know real roots of Canada's colonial project and 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 the legacy of colonialism on these lands. Um, you know, it actually uh, leads me to a, to a question I wanted to give. And thank you again to all three of you for those really excellent introductory remarks. And I think it really covers the, the and shows how uh, complex these issues are. Um, it shows, you know, that there's a lot for us to dig into. So I'm looking forward to our, our, our conversation now about, about all these. Um, does make it, you know, there's so much, it's a little hard to think of where to start as well, because there are so many directions we could go in. Um, but what you were saying, Pam, made me remember uh, something that I learned when I started working at ICLMG that I think is very little known, and that's that um, one of the very first uses and first public uses of the powers granted in the Anti-Terrorism Act was in fact a, a raid on um, the homes of two uh, Indigenous land defenders um, on the West Coast in September 2002 on uh, trumped up allegations of, of gun possession, but it was done using the newly created uh, inter... Um, uh, so Integrated Terrorism 
uh, ITAC, the uh, inter no, sorry, INSET, inter Integrated National Security Enforcement Teams. Um, there were no guns found. Um, it, there were no charges laid, uh, but an entire neighborhood was evacuated um, in order to conduct this raid. And I think it really uh, highlights, you know, so soon after these laws were put in place that they weren't being used in the ways that they were justified um, as, as being, you know, the reasons being um, to justify why they were created. So maybe building on that, I was wondering if uh, each of you can maybe speak some more about some of these ways that we've seen the overreach and expansion of anti-terrorism laws over the past uh, 20 years. Um, examples of, of, of how we've seen them go, uh, you know, go too far, even though even the, the, uh, the initial um, scope of them are, uh, was, was questionable. Um, but just how have we seen this grow and being used in, in ways maybe expected and unexpected since uh, 2001? Anyone want to uh, pick up? I can. Thanks, Aziza. I can start if, not, if no one else wants to go first. Um, I think it's telling also that in other settler colonial countries, such as New Zealand, um, indigenous land defenders were also the first targets of the anti-terrorism laws that were passed there. And so we have this pernicious situation where Canada and New Zealand, settler colonial states, also the states that have had some of the most significant massacres at mosques in recent histories, uh, a sign of the white supremacism and violence that is embedded in the very legal structures of these states, now using these very same acts of racism to justify further expansion of these anti-terrorism laws, which we know yet again, the first casualties of which will be indigenous land defenders, Muslim communities, black communities, um, other racialized communities. I think so much of our discourse on national security laws, the national security framework, itself reproduces the ideological limits of the national security war on terror state itself. So for example, we talk about these applications of national security laws, counterterrorism powers to indigenous land and water defenders, to environmental activists. We talk about these as an overreach or an overextension of national security laws as if there is a legitimate core of reasonable targets to whom these laws should be applied. But when we take the broader scope of looking at the war on terror in the context of colonial histories, which have largely been erased from the way that we talk about national security, you know, we often talk about national security as if it only became racist after 9-11, as if it's not premised on an entire 500 years of violent colonization of indigenous peoples, which set the foundation for the state sovereignty, which now claims the power to enact the war on terror. Um, the longer histories of colonization of intertwined anti-Muslim, anti-Indigenous, anti-Jewish, anti-Black violence lying behind the constitution of these laws and these formations of violence is often erased or ignored. Uh, so, for example, we know that the Bush government explicitly invoked precedents from the so-called Indian wars, the genocidal campaigns of extermination against indigenous peoples um, in the US explicitly invoked precedents from the Indian so-called Indian wars, as well as precedents from French colonization of Algeria, um, apartheid South Africa to justify the types of powers that they were wielding in the, in the so-called um, war on terror, powers which now as Pam has um, has so um, explicitly analyzed uh, are now being wielded against um, indigenous uh, land and water defenders. The Indian wars themselves were based on doctrines uh, that had their origins in papal edicts that justified the dispossession and enslavement of Jewish and Muslim peoples um, in the Crusades. And so when we think about the war on terror and the way that its powers are being applied, it's uh, it's really not a question of overreach or overextension of a somehow legitimate rational core of state violence that's being applied, but rather it goes to the very foundations of the violent constitution of the Canadian state itself. Um, well, maybe I'll go uh, next. I, th I think that's a really important uh, question to have, have raised, uh, Tim, and to take us back uh, to that example from 2002. 
Uh, it certainly reminds me, I think back to the debate in and around C-36 uh, in 2001, and certainly as well around C-51 in 2015. Um, and sitting alongside uh, so many Indigenous activists and leaders and academics, people like Pam, who were, uh, who were raising this concern. Uh, and parliamentarians were so dismissive of it. That's ludicrous. There's no way that these powers would be used in, the, in that manner. Uh, there was a lot of that, trust us, trust us. Uh, no, uh, no CSIS official, no RCMP officer officer would dare to, to take that step. They would be slapped down by parliament. Uh, and, and here we have it. Uh, and and I, think, I think a lot of the, the explanation for that lies in the, in the powerful uh, analysis we just heard from Pam uh, as, to, uh, as to the range, uh, number one, the history, the embedded racism, uh, the range of powerful economic interests uh, at play. Uh, and you suddenly put these new enhanced and largely unaccountable powers uh, in their hands. How could we imagine that they're not going to be used? Uh, and, uh, and no one was suggesting they were going to be used every single day, uh, but even just to be used a handful of times uh, uh, in the ways they have been is completely unacceptable. Uh, so it's not a surprise. And, and I think we shouldn't think of it as, and I think Aziza put, pointed at us very, very eloquently, this isn't a notion of, oh my, there's been overreach. Where did that come from? Uh, as if it was not intended, it was not uh, foreseeable uh, because it clearly was. And, uh, um, and it did not take a rocket scientist in 2001 to know that that was likely going to be the case because the whole history globally of, of how anti-terrorism, counter-terrorism, national security laws and activities and policies unfold is all about expansion. It's not that suddenly once you open that door, um, those powers retrench. Um, everywhere, all over the world, we know it's exactly the opposite. And we're continuing to see that. I mean, I, I'm sure all of us have on our mind right now what's, uh, what just happened in October in Israel, uh, the six Palestinian rights organizations, al Haq, Palestinian Def uh, Children International, uh, you know, these incredibly uh, courageous, revered human rights groups, boom, terrorist organizations. Uh, again, is that some sort of unanticipated, unintended overreach? Clearly not. That's it's the game plan here. Uh, and that's why this was a dangerous door to open in the first place. I totally agree with what everybody's saying. And the thing is, is that for us now, the job is even more difficult because once you open the door, you know, it's like when uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said, vote for me, First Nations. I will repeal all of the legislation that the Harper government uh, forced on you that violate your rights. And I'm going to, rep um, you know, amend Bill C-51. And, and I don't think anyone was under this illusion that it was going to be tons and tons of amendments. But the, the overreach, I mean, there's really this overreach around who's now doing this, who's authorized to do this, either formally or informally, this expansive anti-terrorism, the fact that it's gone into the corporate agenda, the fact that every time we do an access to information request, we see that you know anti-terror units are sharing information with these corporations and corporations are engaged in their own monitoring, surveilling, tracking, collecting evidence and sharing with our so-called national anti-terrorism infrastructure really presents it as uh, us versus them. They have essentially been deputized as this national security force for economic interests. I mean, to the extent now that the RCMP even has that group, that you know, community um, resource group that is dedicated just to protect resource activities, which we know is ultimately uh, acting like private security for these corporations. And so, you, we already have a problem with let, like, let's just pick on the RCMP. I mean, all of them, there's an issue, but just let's pick on the RCMP because they also deal in so-called anti-terrorism and, and all of these issues. 
we all know the problems with the RCMP. They are this massive male dominated organization. And the most recent report said that they are infected in every rank in every province with racism, misogyny, homophobia, and violence. Imagine that that's the security force that's going to monitor and surveil First Nations, especially Indigenous women and girls, and all of the Human Rights Watch and other reports, Amnesty International reports, about the interaction between law enforcement and Indigenous women. Now add these corporations, their private security, and all of these man camps into the agenda. And so we're actually creating higher risks for First Nations women and girls with this expansive corporate anti-terrorism. I mean, it's it's even hard to, to get a measure on it, the scope of it, all of the detailed ways, because not we don't get access to everything through access to information. But publicly, what does that do? So publicly, if we treat this as we're sending in the army every time we have an issue with Indigenous people, um, and or we allow corporations to engage in this these activities we're creating the us versus them like just consistently reinforcing it that fuels hate groups right it's almost like an unspoken permission for the kinds of activities that hate groups have and we know that here in canada we have very uh, significant problem with hate groups you know racist groups misogynist groups and indigenous peoples are always on their target and then uh, alex spoke a lot about the advocacy chill around these kinds of measures by me working in this area how much of my life is given up to and, and privacy and safety and security and monitoring and surveilling for simply working in this area and and is is that the balance that we have to take in the name of their primarily economic agenda i haven't seen a real strong anti-terror agenda here it's primarily an economic power agenda and that that creep the informal creep not just what you see within the bounds of the legislation but what you see in practice is what really concerns me because how do you rein in people who are already not rein inable thanks so much pam thanks so much everyone those are really excellent answers and uh, we're starting to get some uh, questions in, in the chat we'll get to those in a little bit a reminder that if you do have questions for the panelists uh, please put them in the chat, and around one o'clock, we'll uh, we'll start to get to those. I just have uh, to say, I love that uh, phrase Pam has just come up with. Not rain inable. <laughs> I think we should all use that. You might not find it in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, it, it's very apt for today's conversation for what we've seen from uh, from these agencies. Um, there's so many questions I, I could ask you. I, I think one that I, I'm curious about um and there's so many directions we could go in but as we've talked about you know these these issues didn't start after 9 11 but there was a shift at that point um and i'm wondering if there are things that you think that you see now that are accepted as being commonplace in terms of national security and policing um that maybe even uh 20 years ago we we would have questioned more um what are some things that maybe we uh, shouldn't and that maybe the the public or, or the government or others kind of take for granted that are just acceptable now, but that we need to be really uh, re rethinking and, and continuing to um, to push back against. It's for anyone to kind of. Well, I've got my mic still open, so maybe I'll go first. Um, uh, oh, I mean, this this could be a really long list. I, th I think I'm, I'm just going to flag two things that come first um, to mind for me. One is, and I I guess this is one of the concerns I flagged a bit in my opening comments, but it is, it is the very, it is the fact that the definition of terrorism is now amongst us. Uh, it's it's part of our legal framework, uh, and um, uh, and of course we've had so many different episodes. We've just talked about the ways in which it's been used against Indigenous land defenders. Uh, on a whole other um, side of the spectrum, of course, earlier this year we had it used against. Uh, right-wing white supremacist uh, violent organizations uh, with who, who obviously are odious and have a have a horrific agenda um, was that helpful uh, to to use this uh, incredibly flawed problematic 
uh, uh, human rights violating legal framework uh, uh, against them and kind of to further legitimize the, the framework as, as a solid and meaningful approach to, uh, to addressing concerns in society. I certainly was one of the voices that said no. Uh, I know it was a difficult debate, but so, so there's that side of things. Um, uh, the other is just surveillance, 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 surveillance. How can we not flag that? And, uh, and that's, I guess, a combination of where law reform has taken us, uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, what has happened and what's been countenanced uh, and not addressed outside of legal frameworks when it comes to surveillance. And then, of course, the, the exponential growth of, of technology uh, at the same time. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we all worry that um, even though I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's disquieting for almost everyone, um, there is this kind of shrug the shoulders kind of notion that pervades, uh, I think, society now uh, around that. Uh, and uh, I think part of it, just people feel that it's, it's kind of way beyond us to kind of imagine it, figure it out and address it. And, and thus a little bit of a fatalism and fait accompli around that, which, you know, and some of that, I think, you know, we do go back to, to what was unleashed and begun uh, in 2001 and that, and there is kind of a direct line from there to here. Over to someone else. Um, well, I'll just add, because obviously all of that, um, the way in which the state continues to respond, so not just in terms of, you know, the RCMP and monitoring and surveilling, but it's also the steps they take to prevent us from having information. So they continue to have information creep about what they consider themselves entitled to. But now you have RCMP setting up illegal exclusion zones already set out by courts to say that that's illegal, stopping media in our country from being able to report on what's happening and whether it is or is not a dangerous situation. You have human rights observers specifically. They're just to observe what's happening in different scenarios, to try to document and them being arrested and removed. So it's like they get access to incrementally more information on these you know, national security grounds, but we get less and less information. But it's so egregious the information they get that sometimes we forget about the, the less and less information we're getting, like how that's eroding slowly and slowly, whether it's media, whether it's observers, whether it's a kind of information that we're entitled to with access to information, where the information is held, who is gathering the information, because we're not entitled to anything in the corporate realm. We can't, we can't file an access to information request, hey, Trans Canada, hey, Trans Mountain, hey, Coastal Gas, give me your documents. So I have another concern around this unofficial extension of where information is housed and who has it and what it's used for that we don't really have a grip on now because we're focused on what's in the legislation what the state has and what it doesn't have but what about these other players and you know even in even in lawsuits or civil actions we're only going to be entitled to so much information and that's a real concern for me especially the safety factor for indigenous women and girls Thanks so much, Pam, and thanks, Alex. Aziza, do you want to? Yeah. Um, so picking up where Pam left off, um, this control over information and not only lack of access to information, but also selective leakage of information in order to further demonize, impugn the very people who are suffering the most concentrated abuses of the national security state. This control and selected um, access and control over information is not only used as a shield to protect security agencies from scrutiny, but it's also used as a sword to attempt to discredit the very people who are calling attention to these abuses. Um, Elaine Scarry, Harvard professor, pointed this out about the use of the Patriot Act in the United States, that the um, academics and human rights activists who were um, organizing against it were repeatedly discredited by virtue of the fact that the state 
by not making available the most basic information that we should have available to be able to scrutinize the operation of these massive powers, by not making available this most basic information, the state not only manages to protect itself, but also to discredit the critiques of, of these abusive practices. And so in the Canadian context, um, I think it's very important to note that not only do we have an expansion and entrenchment of these powers with Bill C-51, as Pam noted, in some respects also with Bill C-59, which was the uh, Liberals proclaimed initiative to address the deficits and problems with Bill C-51, but in certain cases simply expanded and entrenched French powers of mass surveillance without enacting any kind of adequate review or oversight mechanisms. While we have this expansion, we simultaneously have the continuing refusal of the Canadian state to disclose even the most basic race disaggregated, religion disaggregated data about its national security practices so that it's claimed that it's not engaging in racial and religious profiling can actually be, um, can actually be analyzed from outside of it, even though this data was um, it was requested by the Canadian Human Rights Commission over a decade ago that that should be revealed. And so the consistent pattern with uh, Canada's war on terror has been the perpetual extension of powers and the perpetual erection of walls to scrutinize and uh, to, to shield any of these powers from ex external scrutiny. I think perhaps one of the most pernicious signs of the power of the war on terror framework is the way that the concept of quote unquote terrorism is now being taken up in some quarters as an anti-racist or potentially feminist concept that we can criminalize white supremacist or uh, patriarchal violence um, as being quote unquote terrorism in a way which disconnects the private violence of so-called white supremacist or patriarchal extremists from the white supremacism and patriarchy that's embedded in the settler colonial national security state itself, which is then according to discipline, these acts of violence as if it's something separate from its own violent uh, foundations. And as we see in cases such as that of uh, Nathaniel Veltman, uh, who was the London attacker who killed uh, four members of a, of a single Muslim family in, his, uh, in, in, a, in a rampage earlier this year, the, the, um, the launching of terrorism charges against Veltman really serves as more of a facade to mask the ongoing racism of the operation of anti-terrorism powers. Beltman is not being criminalized in the same way that Muslims who have been the primary targets of anti-terrorism laws have been criminalized for the last 20 years. He hasn't been targeted using any of these preventive measures or very expansive measures that criminalize acts distance from violence. He's being criminalized for an act of murder that has already been committed. And yet the, the equivocation on the, on the question of terrorism to act as if, oh, well, he's being charged with terrorism, which then therefore shows that anti-terrorism measures are now being equal opportunity expanded is really just a veil for the continuing color line in the continuing operation of anti-terrorism powers. Similarly, we saw with the uh, addition of a few white supremacist groups to the terrorist entities list that this occurred at the same time as several more Muslim groups, including one Kashmiri group, uh, was added and we can uh, you know uh, analyze and scrutinize the use of violence um, in Kashmir but we have to acknowledge that Kashmiris are acting in a context of overwhelming military power uh, ex executed against them by India it's the most concentrated military occupation in the world and so the the problem with the anti-terrorism framework as a way for understanding violence is that it scrutinizes acts of private violence as disconnected from the overwhelming violence of the state. And the absurdities of this framework for understanding violence are really highlighted in the way that uh, Kashmiris, uh, Palestinians, uh, Uyghurs are labeled as terrorists, while the genocidal acts of state violence that are deployed against them are then framed as counterterrorism and not terrorism itself. Yeah, thanks so much, Aziza. Do, do any of you have anything else you want to add on, on this question before we move on maybe to some of the questions from the, from the audience? No? Okay, great. Um, well, we've, we've had some really interesting questions come in. And the, and the first one, in it, and I think it's, 
an important one and it, and it builds on what you were just speaking about Aziza in terms of the use of um, anti-terrorism laws to fight, to fight uh, or to be harnessed in the so-called fight against racism and against Islamophobia. And uh, Sarah asks, um, we recently see uh, an increasing willingness to prosecute non-Muslims under criminal anti-terrorism laws, uh, such as the recent anti-Islamic murders in London, Ontario. Is using the anti-terror regime against those who terrorize Muslims and other communities beneficial in your view? And you, you just spoke really clearly to that, Aziza. Um, it would be interesting to hear what others have to say. And it also touched on something that we spoke about bef before this panel. <clears throat> And that's just the, you know, if, if we can also add this idea of the, the growing use of national security laws to address other harms within society, whether it, it, it's racism, whether it's, you know, harnessing CSIS to help fight, you know, future pandemics, or um, um, uh, the use of national security laws to address a climate crisis, for example. Um, I was curious what, uh, yeah, what, what, what each of you think about this idea of harnessing anti-terrorism laws to fight other um, areas, but especially and specifically the, this most recent uh, discussion around using it to address um, uh, racist and white supremacist violence. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, I mean, I think I, I made a, a few comments as well that um, that I think that was uh, the wrong approach to take. Uh, and, you know, and, and obviously the proviso here is I, you know, I couldn't more passionately agree that we need a full out, full on, uh, thoughtful, effective, constructive approach to dealing with. Uh, white supremacist organizations, uh, you know, not only at their extreme of, of acts of physical violence, but, uh, but in all manifestations. Uh, do I think that the anti-terrorism approach is the right way to do it? Number one, I don't think it, uh, I don't think it adds anything. <laughs> so I, I think it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. I think it's a lot of, it's a great press release um, uh, and that sort of thing, but, uh, but I don't think it's somehow, oh, well, there that does it. Um, that'll be the demise of the Proud Boys. Uh, clearly not. Um, but secondly, and I think more fundamentally, it is uh, when we have an approach to law enforcement and security uh, that is so off base from its very outset uh, that um, that that ignores. Uh, what the real human rights concerns and realities are, but worse, um, you know, has frameworks and laws and activities that that deepen and exacerbate those human rights concerns. Why would we want to add to that? Why would we want to legitimize that? Why would we want to expand it uh, when when we should be doing everything we can to work towards its 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 undoing? Uh, to to give it this this sheen of of being you know a central and important tool for for law enforcement and security to address all manner of concerns in society, uh, I think is deeply problematic. I think that's so true. When you think about at every opportunity, even in the worst disaster like nine eleven, you saw you could almost visibly see people salivating at the mouth like ah think of what we can do now you know buy more guns and and a war in another country and we can just pass all of these laws and we're going to have all of this public sympathy like they use these that's why i say like the politics of it is equally important even beyond the legislation the opportunism that's involved in constantly trying to get more control in what should be ultimately uh, you know democratic societies but i think if going forward we have a different framework about all of this so we know anti-terror doesn't work um because every time there's an issue and it's, it's just another opportunity to add a whole bunch more people or do a whole bunch more things. So you're, you're trapped in it. Whereas if we look at this as like, you know, human health, safety, and well-being, and environmental health, safety, and well-being, just at their core, what do those things involve? Well, it's certainly not a discussion around terror, but it could be a discussion on how do you address anti-hate? How do you address anti-racism? 
how do you address environmental destruction and those naturally lead you to a conversation more around the uh, framework and, and lens of human rights, um, science around the environment, and of course, Indigenous laws and practices and Indigenous governance. So you've got a problem where who is making all of these decisions? We should at a minimum be joint governors in this territory, and we don't even have a say over what's happening, who is and how all of this stuff is framed. But, you know, when we look at it like a monster that needs to be attacked, you think about weapons, whereas what we should be looking at is, well, human health, safety and well-being, environmental health, safety and well-being. And then it's like, well, you know what, let's refocus back, rebalance things back into human rights. And then we don't have a need for those discussions. That anti-terrorism discussion is really about how to empower governments, how to empower states, how to empower corporations. It's it, it's tied into the economics of it all when we really should get back to the basics of environmental science and human rights and Indigenous practices. And it would be an entirely different conversation because we're focusing on what what are we doing to keep people protected and what are the threats? Well, you know, we, we've got violence and racism and hatred and okay, so what do we do about that? Instead of trying to create this thing which has literally become an uncontrollable monster. And I think from the pandemic response as well as earlier experiences with, for example, the US Army responding to climate change catastrophes, from these examples, we see how undesirable it is when natural disasters, pandemics, climate change are treated as uh, under the framework of security threats or under the frameworks of war. The supposed solutions that we see being promulgated are things like greater surveillance, greater border controls, without actually dismantling any of the structures of violence that lead to the um, maldistribution of vulnerability in the first place without dismantling the capitalist structures of exploitation that force people into dangerous work situations uh, without dismantling the prisons and jails that put people who are incarcerated in these institutions of violence at such risk. And so I think our recent history actually gives us a very powerful critique of the ongoing use of institutions of securitization and war to address the uh, the, the social effects of climate change and other um, other catastrophes that are themselves the product not of natural disasters but of very human created systems of oppression and justice and violence. Uh, I think we need to learn from Black and Indigenous abolitionist scholars and scholars and critics of carceral feminism about the dangers and paradoxes of attempting to use tools of state violence in order to address um, acts of private violence. Uh, Pam, Pam has talked uh, very powerfully about the racism and misogyny um, embedded in the RCMP. When it comes to CSIS too, we know that although many of their actions are hidden behind walls of, of, of um, secrecy, that when we do get glimpses of what is happening within CSIS, they're, they're horrifying, reproducing much of the white supremacist discourse uh, that we are saying that they are the solution um, in order to address. For example, the lawsuits by former CSIS employees, which discuss, which um, disclosed the grotesque forms of Islamophobic, homophobic, racist discourse that the very employees of those institutions were subjected to. Things like a poster uh, with the picture of the World Trade Center uh, being bombed on it with the words 99 names of Allah um, inscribed on it. We also know from um, the case about the entrapment of Karodi and Natal, who are a mentally vulner uh, vulnerable um, couple who were forced effectively by the RCMP to participate in a bomb plot. Uh, we know that in, in cases like that, uh, Muslim employees of the RCMP were specifically uh, deployed in order to act as uh, religious authorities to convince this poor couple to to uh, go along with this plot that was manufactured uh, by, by the RCMP. And so even, um, you know, claims of diversification of these institutions of violence don't actually end up addressing the racism at their core, but rather further extending and expanding their capacity to infiltrate and enact, and enact violence on the communities 
on the other ends of their surveillance scopes and their and their guns. Um, and so I think we really need to connect the discourse and the conversations we're having about national security and the war on terror to the long established discourses of, of abolition and calling attention to the impossibility of reforming institutions that are at their core inherently violent like police. I think part of the limitations of our conversations on national security is that we tend to treat it like a black box, a state of exception that's isolated and disconnected from the quote unquote ordinary operation of law, ordinary operation of policing, when in fact they're intricately uh, intertwined and interlinked. And so we need to take our inspiration from those long standing critics of these institutions of state violence that came before us, starting with Black and Indigenous abolitionist discourse. Thanks so much, everyone. And yes, thanks so much, Aziza. That was, uh, you know, I think that's an ongoing question that we have at ICLMG with our focus on, on national security and anti-terrorism um, and how that, you know, ties into the, the really necessary conversations that are happening around defunding police, reallocating resources, and, um, you know, that the actions of, of CSIS and the RCMP and anti-terrorism work in general is not separate from those, from those conversations, but often uh, get left to the side when, when we're having those conversations. So th thanks for, for raising that. Um, we have a question, an, another question. Uh, I'm gonna try to sneak in two more. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, and uh, we're gonna have to uh, end this at 1.30, although I'm, I'm sure there, there's so much more we could be, be talking about. Um, but it's a, we have a question from Paul who asks if someone can comment on the use of artificial intelligence and algorithms to target mar marginalized peoples by police forces. And that's, uh, it's, a, it's an important question also in the context that we have seen the change in the, the technological tools uh, and approaches of, of national security and, and law enforcement agencies over the past 20 years. So I was wondering if anybody would like to, uh, to take that up. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start off. I, I'm sure everyone has, has views on this. Um, uh, obviously, you know, a big flashing red light of concern here. Uh, and uh, in some respects, it, it feels like this has, has become a juggernaut over the, the last few years. Uh, I mean, there were many activists, many scholars, um, especially at the grassroots, uh, who were, have been flagging this in very early days. Uh, but it clearly in the last uh, few years has become apparent uh, that this is not just some sort of fanciful science fiction scenario that that these technologies are going to have this this sinister problematic racist discriminatory element to it which I think maybe in early days a lot of people um, wanting to put their trust in technology somehow you know technology is good technology Technology is advancing society. We all use technology. Uh, how could it be this uh, this sinister villainous force? Um, and uh, and we now know that's absolutely the case. That the information is irrefutable. The examples are are becoming legion uh, across Canada and around the world. Um, and whether it's in 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 the the context of what brings us together today, uh, the the national security realm. Uh, or uh, the much wider, broader realm of, uh, of policing and law enforcement. And uh, uh, very important, as Aziz has noted, to kind of remind ourselves always that we can't be separating those two. Those tentacles uh, are, are completely entwined. Um, uh, but in all of those contexts, uh, this has become so problematic. And that's why there is now so much organizing and mobilizing and advocacy and campaigning uh, trying to address this uh, you know, in, in countries all over the world now, really important uh, efforts to, to ban facial recognition, uh, for instance, which has just proven itself time and time again, no matter, you know, I'm not a technical expert, no matter what efforts have perhaps been taken to try to address the concerns about its, in particular, its, its racist uh, impact, um, it, it just doesn't get any better. Uh, and so I, I think I, I think it was an open ended question, but I guess I guess my message would be I couldn't I, I think the question implies concern as well from the questioner. Uh, but uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and I think, you know, an exhortation to everyone uh, that 
this is one of the very vital human rights concerns of our time. Uh, and, and it's staggering to imagine where we might be with respect to this six months from now, a year from now, three years from now. Uh, I mean, my mind can't even figure it out, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's deeply, deeply worrying where, uh, where this can continue to be headed. Um, and so we all, all really need to be attentive to those campaigns. Thanks, Alex. Pam or uh, Aziza on this one, or if not, we'll move to the last, uh, last one. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Pam, do you wanna go first? Okay. Uh, well, first, I want to give a shout out to the excellent work that ICLMG um, has been doing on this issue, as ICLMG does on so many issues. And no, Tim did not pay me to say that I'm not getting any kind of kickback. Uh, ICLMG has really been doing um, vital work on this issue. Obviously, the, the problem um, with the use of artificial intelligence in law enforcement policing national security context is with the underlying racialization at the conception of threat that AI is working according to, that it um, ends up incorporating all of those same biases in national security and law enforcement practices uh, as when they are enacted by humans, even while purporting to be uh, to take human judgment and biases out of the equation and therefore uh, project an image of techno-neutrality, techno-utopianism. Uh, but when it comes to addressing Islamophobia in particular and the threat of Islamophobic ideas being embedded in national security applications of artificial intelligence, I think one of the one of the primary problems is the fact that the Islamophobic foundations of national security practices are often not even recognized as being racist in the first place, but simply as reflecting an accurate and rational assessment of what constitutes a threat. Uh, Pam talked earlier about how um, indigenous uh, practices such as uh, hunting, um, tobacco smoking were criminalized as threats. And in the national security context, we see similarly with Islam, how basic expressions of Muslim identity, such as wearing certain kinds of clothes, growing a beard. In the case of, I think some people were talking in the chat about uh, cases of Muslims who were tortured with Canadian complicity. In those cases, we saw how acts such as uh, writing a will before going on Hajj pilgrimage, which is a very, you know, fundamental act that Muslims uh, perform when engaging in what is a central pillar of our of our system of worship. My grandfather, you know, went on Hajj many times and, and wrote and wrote wills. Would he be considered a terrorist for that? But those are the kinds of things get they get marked as red flags of radicalization in this deeply racist national security discourse. And the challenge is that when those get embedded in AI and algorithms, which are made perhaps even more impenetrable to external scrutiny, um, and yet continue to form the foundations of these expanded uh, practices of surveillance and targeting, um, but that incorporate the, the racist logic that's embedded at the very core of national security and law enforcement practices, but are so pernicious precisely because they are not recognized as racist, but simply uh, neutral, uh, even, even as being common sense. And I think that's what's really uh, dangerous about all of this. Yeah, and the only short thing that I'll add is that there is sometimes a perception in society that data is objective um, and that and and think about you know well we're just putting into into a computer it doesn't have any ideologies you just put in the objective data but think about arrest rates you know that the data that goes in there who manufactures those arrest rates you know it's the the racism within policing, the racial targeting, the profiling, the you know making arrests in certain communities. Of course, that's going to generate data that says, "Look at all these arrest rates in this community. Maybe this is a community that we should be concerned about." When that it was all generated. So even though the computer might just objectively say, "Oh, let's look for the most problematic community," the data itself comes from it's manufactured in a racist way and you can just apply that all across the board and i don't see how any ai system is going to be able to pick that out and and screen for that and weed that out and then look at a real significant threat in that way when the data that's fed in 
it's not objective. It's all it's all race based. It's already contaminated. So the best information that it's getting is contaminated. It's making a contaminated decision, not unlike a human being, except that many people in society think of it as objective, as not ha coming from all of these human biases, when in fact, if that's all it's fed, that's all it can dish out. And it's, a, it's literally as simple as that, but it's more heinous than that because of all of the, all of the data is already so contaminated. Actually, can I just say one more, yeah, one yeah. more very, very quick thing, which is, um, in addition to the law enforcement applications of AI, I think we also have to be concerned about um, the uh, sort of uh, parallel applications in, for example, policing speech on social media in ways which we know end up being prim primarily repressive of Indigenous, Palestinian, Black communities whose speech is disproportionately flagged as terrorist or hateful by these supposedly uh, neutral algorithms. And this is uh, very much at stake right now in the Canadian context with the online harms legislation that has been proposed by the Liber Liberal government, again, under the aegis of anti-hate and addressing online harms, yet threatens to further um, intensify and entrench the repression of already uh, marginalized and over-policed communities on social media. Uh, ICLMG is involved in, a, in, a, in um, challenging this and in addressing this. Uh, so that's just something for to be on everyone's uh, radar, this particular uh, proposed legislation. Thanks, everybody. Those were really great, great answers to that question. Um, we, we only have about five minutes left, so we're going to have to wrap up very soon. Um, uh, leave the hardest question to, to the end where we have to rush it. But there's been a, a few similar questions in the chat, and it's one that I think we all ask ourselves quite often, and that's what can we do about this? Um, you know, it, people expressing that they've been involved in these issues for the past 20 years themselves and feel exhausted, or seeing how the government refuses to even recognize the most basic rights of, of Indigenous communities and, and rights of uh, free and prior informed consent. Uh, you know, how do we expect them to? you know, then peel back these anti-terrorism laws. Um, my colleague Anne is gonna share a, a link to our news digest on our website where we, we often share some of these ideas of what we can do. So if people would like to subscribe, please, please do so. But just to wrap things up, um, Aziza, Alex and, and, and Pam, if you have thoughts on that. And I know some of you have to leave right at 1.30. So, you know, I'll also say thanks so much for, for uh, your incredible insights today. It's really an honor to have the three of you gathered to, to, to share your thoughts and, and to exchange on these. Um, gives us a lot of uh, things to think about at ICLMG about how we go forward and how we, how we think about these issues. So um, thank you so much. And yeah, your thoughts on, on uh, where do we go from here? Okay, maybe I'll give Alex a break and go first this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just really quickly, I say we go everywhere. We meet them on every front, on every issue, on every manner possible. Sometimes we think of like, what is the solution? The solution is multifold. It can be public education. It can be redirecting the media. It can be financial support to organizations and institutions and communities that are grappling with these issues. It can be litigation sometimes. It's international human rights advocacy. Um, it's international global interdiplomacy and work and action and research on all of these issues basically take your pick it's it's political ad advocacy in parliament it's pushing people like literally it's everything we just need to keep doing it all i don't think there's going to be one solution and i also think you know at, at the very core we also need to be empowering grassroots people because they're very powerful every advancement we've ever had in anything human rights has come from people marching in the streets and having teach-ins and strategizing and sharing food and like doing all of those things. And I think we always need to support the grassroots. And of course, uh, Indigenous people, including more and more Indigenous peoples in these things uh, are fundamental. Okay, I, I can go next. Um, so, the short answer is I I don't really know <laughs> because over the last 20 years, I think we've seen how it takes years and years and years to have even the most 
basic mitigations of violence, and then often those end up being co-opted by the state to demonstrate its supposed responsiveness to human rights concerns, even as the structure of violence as a whole gets more deeply consolidated and entrenched. So this is a very tentative, speculative um, answer because it's aimed towards a future which I think in many cases it's impossible for us to even fully visualize or see. Uh, but I think first of all it's important that we change the framework within which we think about and address and talk about these questions. Often we approach the question of war on terror abuses as a matter of um, reforms or tinkering to a state power that is otherwise considered to be legitimate. And I think we need to switch to one that's more based on principles of abolitionism and total decolonization of the state. Uh, Mariam Kaba, in the context of police abolition work in the United States, has a very um, helpful resource. Um, it's, a, it's a guide to um, analyzing what types of state reforms of state institutions uh, we should oppose because they, while perhaps purporting to address some of the most obvious manifestations of violence, end up further entrenching these institutions of violence as a whole. So what types of reforms we should oppose versus which reforms uh, we can support because they are truly aimed towards an abolitionist future. And I think that we need to start adopting a similar um, analytic framework for the struggles that we're waging here in the context um, of the of the Canada's war on terror. So uh, thank you again, uh, Tim and ICLMG, Pam, Alex, and all of you for everything that you've that you've brought to this uh, forum of thinking together um, here this afternoon. Um, uh, I was actually going to say something a little bit like Aziza did at the beginning. You know, if only there was <laughs> a magical answer to this. Um, uh, it is it is tough to kind of put out the you know, the one convincing, encouraging, you know, do this, go this direction and all will be well. That said, um, uh, I think there's two overarching things that come to mind for me. Um, uh, the first, and I think this picks up on something from Pam as well, um, absolutely at every turn, listen for, amplify, lift up the, the voices, the insights, the wisdom, the experience, of survivors uh, uh, at the front lines of this struggle uh, and the communities uh, who are uh, sort of waging these struggles. Uh, the wisdom that is there uh, is so often overlooked um, at best until 10 years later, uh, at which point everyone's going, oh, if only we knew. Well, you did know <laughs> and you were told and you ignored. Um, and it's the courage of survivors coming forward, people like Meher Awar, Omar Khadr, Abdullah Al Malki, Muyad Nuruddin, uh, uh, Abu Sufyan Abdul Razik, Kazan Diab, uh, a long list who, who have put themselves and their stories out there uh, to tell us, um, to ensure that we understand. Uh, and at every turn, um, we need to follow their lead. And then the last thing I would say, and perhaps this isn't surprising coming from me, is make it all about human rights. Uh, it, it's not just uh, that we need to, in a more you know, cosmetic way, make sure that kind of human rights are included in the press releases, or there's a nice reference to human rights in the preamble to the next national security reform. We need to work to make sure that human rights leapfrogs over national security and that what we start to witness is an all out uncompromising mega resourced commitment to making the human rights vision come to life. All rights, all people, all places, all times. That's of course what human rights require, but that is nothing separate and apart from security either. And we've got to do everything we can to make that become our reality. And thank you uh, to everyone. Thanks so much to Aziza and Pam, uh, to Tim and Anne, uh, and to all you great folks who have been on the line today. Thanks, Alex. And thanks, Aziza and Pam, Pam for leaving us with those really great, you know, it, it is a trudge, it is difficult, but um, I think your words also give a lot of energy, uh, a lot of ideas of, of where to look and, and how we can move forward. So uh, I, I really appreciate that.
And um, I'm looking forward to the next time that we'll be able to talk about these issues and to continue to work with all of you to, uh, to fight back against the, the securitization of our lives. Um, and thank you to everyone who uh, participated and joined us today. It's really great to see so many people joining us who are interested um, in uh, you know, hearing the thoughts and, and input from our three wonderful speakers for sharing your questions and your own thoughts. Um, we'll be posting a recording of this uh, on, our, on our website and sharing on social media in the coming days. So please uh, feel free to, uh, we'll message you when that's up and please feel free to share that. Uh, with your your colleagues and friends and in your networks and you know even just publicly with people you don't know so that they're they're learning about this um, and if you do uh, as I mentioned um, want to follow this more as I said my colleague Anne has shared um, the link to our news digest that we send out every two weeks that deals with uh, and shares information uh, on, on issues like these um, and then last thing a, a big thank you to my my colleague Anne who's been uh, doing all the the tech support and and, and following your questions and um, uh, for all of their support for, for today's event. Um, we'll leave it at that. Th thanks, everybody. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your days.